And hello to you all. My name is Andrew Chung. I'm artistic director of uh, Inner Chamber. And this is the final installment of Inner Chamber Connections for this season, our sixth and final installment. And Inner Chamber Connections allows us a chance to speak to some of our wonderful artists participating in this season of music. And today I have Peter Shackleton, our clarinetist core, core member, clarinetist extraordinaire. Hello, Peter. Hi, Andrew. And later on, we will magically be uh, inviting Ben Bolt Martin to join us to chat about Beethoven. But to start our chat today, we are going to talk about what Peter is playing on this program. And what are we playing on this program, Peter? Uh, we are playing a uh, clarinet quintet by Bernard Herman also known as his Souvenir du Voyage. Souvenir du Voyage. Yes. And <clears throat> as I understand it, this was one of his final pieces or maybe his final piece? Yeah, it was actually, yeah, his last chamber work or concert piece that he wrote. And it was written in 1967. And so, he went on to write some further film scores, but in terms of you know pieces for the concert hall, this was the last one. Film scores, of course. So Bernard Herrmann, not known so much for his concert stage works, but uh, certainly known for his film scores. So this is the guy who, who partnered with Alfred Hitchcock, most notably, right? Yes. Um, and, then, and then also, interestingly enough, like he also, his initial, a lot of his initial work was with Orson Welles doing radio dramas. Right. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And, and so that's, that's where he's kind of got his, his start into, you know, I guess, you know, writing music for, I, I guess, sort of radio plays onto films, so on and so forth. Right, right. And then he, did he write for Citizen Kane then? Uh, did he do the music for that? I'm not sure. You, you know, I, and, and I'm, I'm momentarily trying to plan. Yeah. You know, I, I, I could sort of pick up my phone and look. But, uh, no, no, no worries. But the Hitchcock films, he did uh, Vertigo for sure. He did North by, by Northwest and and Psycho, so yeah. most notably. So, um, you know, <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. And there's Derek with the Psycho knife. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we should never record these things on a Sunday morning. Holy cow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So uh, take me through uh, how, uh, uh, let, let, let's go back and, and how did this piece get, get programmed onto this, uh, onto this program? Well, well it, it's, you know, it's kind of one of those, well, for me, an, an interesting story. Um, it was, you know, and I can't remember how many years ago it was, but it was sort of towards the end of the uh, thunder, the orchestra season up in Thunder Bay, and and you know, and, and things. I remember, I remember, I was washing my kitchen floor, and and I had CBC Radio on just to kind of keep me company as as I was working on, and this this what I thought really cool piece, you know, came on the radio. I sort of joined it part way through, so you know, I was listening, not knowing what it was, and you know, it was a piece for clarinet and strings, and I was quite captivated and then you know when it was over it said you know it was this piece by Bernard Herman so I made a note of that and then uh shortly after my arrival back in in Stratford uh I ran into you on on the street and you you know uh you know I, I can't remember which one of us said it first but it was like you know you know did you happen to hear this this piece on Sunday afternoon on on CBC radio and I said yes wasn't it great and we thought okay well let's let's uh let's do it yeah, I remember uh, it was one of those things that I had the radio on and uh, at CBC and I was in the car and it was one of those where I was driving the family somewhere and, and then pulled up in the driveway. I was like, OK, go away, go away. Got to finish, you know, <laughs> hearing the piece. And it's all about that that thing at the end where you <clears throat> you wait to hear what the thing was, because if you don't, you miss it, then uh, and that's really too bad. And then, yeah, I remember making a point, mental note, must talk to Peter about this. Um and so you have never played this before. No, no. And, and you know, and actually, and it, it sort of it was then kind of a little bit of a challenge to go through just to to find the music because it's 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 no longer in print. Mm -hmm. And but you know, we obviously did manage to sort of to hunt it down. And uh, yeah, and it was a piece I, I wasn't aware of before. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it, it's been a really it's been a great discovery. 
Yes, I and mean, you've played pretty much everything, so <laughs> it's a, it's a challenge not to find something that's a that's a new for you. So this is really neat. Um, so you know that's a plug for public radio, right? It gets us gives us something to uh, to talk about, <clears throat> and and it and it puts things in our lap that we uh, in our ears that we wouldn't you know be able to to stumble across by ourselves. Yeah. So uh, cl at clarinet. Quintet. It's a bit of a thing. Um, it's not like there's hundreds of them, like there are string quartets, but there, there's there's enough notable pieces. Um, you know, starts with Mozart. Yeah, M Mozart sort of started the ball rolling in terms of you know the quintet form. Uh, you, you know, there, there were quartets, which was you know sort of clarinet, one violin, viola, cello, sort of in around the time. But but you know to actually go to sort of you know taking you know these uh, you know. Uh, String quartet and adding clarinet to it. Mozart was the first, and then sort of most notably after that, then it would be Weber, and then on to Brahms, and then you know sort of there are sort of various 20th century composers that kind of took on the medium as well. But but thinking you know Mozart, Weber, and Brahms are are probably the biggies. It's interesting because it, I I guess it I didn't I wasn't aware that they were clarinet quartets so much. But then maybe it switched over to the clarinet quintet because the string quartet, as a as a, as a genre in itself, was became quite a identifiable um, ensemble, yes. a notable ensemble for which you know all the composers compose for. And so then to add in a, a fifth player, just like we do with inner chamber, is special. Yeah, I mean Peter's always special, but you know, <laughs> <clears throat> with string quartet, it's uh, it, it's it's extra special. Yeah. Um, so this clarinet part, tell me, like, is it playable? Is it awkward? Is it, uh, you know? It, it, it's, it's playable. Like, I'd say for the most part, it's, it's pretty idiomatic. Um, you know, it, it definitely covers, you know, the range of the instrument, like, you know, sort of going, you know, definitely to the low end. But, you know, he does, you know, not ever extensively, but he does kind of, you know, push the, the upper limits. In a, in a couple of points, and and you know, and, and largely sort of much as the case is what Brahms would do, it's largely for dramatic effect. You know, like when he's really wanting you know something to be really you know captivating or well more stirring, and, and you know, and sort of you know going for the drama of it, then you know he'll uh, sort of you know exploit the sort of extreme upper range of the instrument. I'd um, say, I'd say this the string parts are written really well, and I think overall it's not like the dynamics that are written. Like we have to ignore them or anything in order for our balance of the pe par you know parts to be heard. I think that that's all structured really well. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, and, and whether it's because of you know all, all his 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 work in you know doing films and things like that, and just you know he really I, I feel knows how to use instrument and, and exploit the qualities of them. And you know, and there are times you know when. You know, well, we've had we've had one rehearsal so far where you know, like we can be sort of this really sort of small, you know, intimate thing. But there are other times when he really kind of pushes the scope of it as well to sort of make it feel like okay, this is more than five people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So at this time in his life, he'd moved from uh, from Hollywood to uh, over to England and to Italy, and he's spending time there. And I and we hear these flavors. <clears throat> Um, for sure, within this music, um, but you know, it, it, it's this Bernard Herrmann sound. It's this film sound that, like, within three seconds, he can set a scene. You know, and I feel like it's—I don't know. Maybe I just this is the imagination going wild. But like, I, I just feel like, okay, wow, he can—he can just from out of nowhere, he sets this brooding tone, or it's just this—I uh, <clears throat> don't know—very much like a film. Yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting, like thinking, you know, of his film career, in, in his contract, he would often have a clause that he had complete artistic control over, over what was being written, you know, so that a director, you know, couldn't come in and say, okay, you know, I want this to be, you know, bebop pop or, or something. <laughs> it, it would be like, you know, he, he would, you know, look at the first draft, and then sort of start to formulate his score. And especially I think in his work with Hitchcock, that sometimes film scenes would be, you know, lengthened or shortened depend depending on what sort of musical idea he he came up with. So that, 
you know, the music really does become, you know, a character of its own. And so then when he's, you know, he's just said like, you're writing a concert piece, you know, right off the bat, he, he sets a tone. He knows how to tell a story, this guy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. You know, and, you know, and I think as a player, you find like immediately, you know, you're pulled kind of right into this and it's like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're on an interesting adventure here. So what sort of uh, influences do we hear in this? Like, what is he drawing on from? Is he drawing from Italy? Is he drawing from England? Or what, what, what do you hear in this? You know, I, I, I definitely hear the English influences. Um, you know, in, in looking at, at the, the, the second movement in particular, it, it uh, you know, it reminds me of, you know, of some Gerald Finzi that I've played and, and, and you know, and whether it's it's just sort of the rhythm, like I, you know, I think the movement is is, is actually called Bersus, but it's it's sort of actually a Sicilian rhythm that's being used. Which um, you know, there are a couple of clarinet pieces that Pinzi wrote where he employs that as well. And, and you know, and, and it's just I don't know. There's something very I'm going to say comforting about it. Mm-hmm. It's like a rocking, rocking, a lilting. Yeah, yeah. and. Yeah. and you know, and it's also part of, you know, like my, you know, the bulk of my heritage is, you know, it's, it's you know, English, Scottish, you know, there's German thrown in there as well. But it, I, I don't know, like, like I find, you know, it resonates somewhere for me, at least inside. Very nice. Very nice. It, that last movement, I just hear all Italian opera and, you know, it's, just, I hear Gianni Schicchi, I hear this Puccini, you know, influence and these, all these, it's characters, right? All these characters. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah, and, you know, and, and definitely, you know, I think in like in reading about the, the pieces, you know, like, and you cited this that, you know, I guess he had in mind, you know, some of Turner's, uh, you know, Venetian paintings, mm-hmm. you know, when he was thinking of the last movement in particular. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when the first two movements were more sort of, you know, referencing some, some literary works, like the first movement um, is, is citing, in, in a sense, Hausmann's um, on Wenlock Edge. Mm-hmm. And then the second movement is actually the Irish playwright uh, sings uh, Riders to the Sea. And, and you know, and so it, it's not, you know, I don't think he's specifically setting out to, to tell a, a specific story, but, but I think you can hear these kind of creative influences on his writing. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to performing this. And, uh, you know, I, I think you are too. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, we don't want to give too much away. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining me today. And uh, we'll see you at concert time. Thanks, Peter. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. And now we welcome Ben Bolt Martin, our cellist and music commentator extraordinaire. Hello, ah. Ben. Hi, Andrew. Okay, so Ben, we're now taking on Beethoven's Opus 59, number two. It has no fancy name behind it. Um, There's a set of three of these so-called Razumovsky quartets. Um, Why are they called the Razumovsky quartets? Well, they're called the Razumovsky quartets because the guy who paid for them was Count Razumovsky. And Count Razumovsky was a Russian noble who spent a lot of time in Vienna and uh, had a lot of money to throw around. And he liked uh, Beethoven's music. So Beethoven said, sure, I'll, uh, I'll write you some music and I'll even throw in some Russian folk tunes just for you. So <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, Beethoven, Beethoven, he knew how to, you know, he, he knew how to, how to get paid. He did. That's a good thing. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a, one of the things that they don't teach you at music school is how to get paid. <laughs> how to get paid, of course. Yes, yes. I'm still, <laughs> still learning. Okay, well, we're digressing. Hang on. We're digressing. Yes. We can do this. We can yes. do this. So <laughs> Beethoven, uh, so by this time, he's 38 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just finished, in terms of his string quartet output, <clears throat> this is the beginning, near the beginning of his middle period of a string quartet writing. He's just finished six Opus 18 quartets. They are fantastic. And, you know, he's, you know, 
Um, he's, he's cutting his chops on these, on these amazing, amazing pieces. They're a little more first violin heavy, these ones. Um, maybe they sit more part of the, in, as part of the classical world. And with these um, Razumovsky quartets, he's just talking bigger ideas. It's just grander in scope. Um, <clears throat> they were written for uh, the, the kind of the, the house band, right? Led by this this fine fine fellow, Ignis <laughs> Schupenzig. <laughs> Schupenzig. Schupenzig, Schupanzig. <laughs> Schupanzig. Yeah. Yeah. So Ignis Schupanzig. Uh, also employed by Count Razumovsky. Yeah. You know, they had a salary. They were the court band. And I think mm -hmm. that the string quartet was a thing. And he, he of course, he had other ensembles, much as much like Inner Chamber does. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and I think that Beethoven had this close collaboration with Schupanzig. <laughs> um, and it maybe elevate, allowed Beethoven to elevate string quartet writing into a into a the next the next realm well this this is kind of stuff that's a little bit hard to sight read for your amateur at home right mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i mean the uh the thing that beethoven did throughout his lifetime was to sort of take music from uh, instrumental music especially from being sort of background noise at uh, parties like i mean I mean, we all, we all, frankly, we all still have played those gigs, you know, where we're there to create a sense of ambiance and, you know, that's a lovely thing and people should continue to hire quartets for their weddings, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, the, everyone uh, wants to hear the Baccarini, uh, quintet, right? Like that's, that's right. We, we talked about this previous concert, but anyway, that's anyway. right. Everybody wanted, to, everybody wanted to have sort of this background in music kind of stuff like that, but Beethoven just, he, he wouldn't have it. He just had this idea in, in mind that he, he what he did um instrumentally was just as important as as the operas and this may have been due to the fact that he wasn't particularly good at writing operas but uh, what he did really well was instrumental music and he thought he was pretty important and what he did was pretty important so he sort of changed the 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 vibe so yeah he, his chamber music all of a sudden became stuff that you had to practice and present and people had to listen to it you know you do, if you've ever tried to play a Beethoven uh, quartet for a background show like play or for background music at a party or a wedding or something like that it doesn't work it's, it's a bad great. idea it's <laughs> don't, a bad don't idea. Do don't do it. But Beethoven doesn't really work for, for weddings. I mean, yeah. whatever, you know, you do your wedding how you have to, but I mean, <laughs> the, the fact is that, that Beethoven, um, Beethoven's music is just too, too interesting. I mean, there's too much going on and, and, you know, it, so he, he really helped make that transition where, where in chamber music became music that you listen to and it became an important part of the, the music that was going on in Vienna. So yeah, th this, um, yeah, he must have had a pretty good band and they must have uh, done a lot of work because I can't imagine this music would have stuck around if uh, they sight read it for someone and uh, <laughs> and uh, the resulting yeah. train crashes that would have happened. Yeah. So It would have been a disaster. It would have sounded like a disaster. In fact, I can't even imagine like reading this stuff off of a handwritten score. You know, mm -hmm. our, uh, the, the Bernard Herrmann parts that we're reading off of, they are handwritten. Yeah. And at part of that, I, I don't know who that copyist was. I don't even know what edition it is, but yeah. it's uh, it's out of print now. And this Beethoven, we are looking at pristine, what they call urtext copies, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Urtext uh, editions, meaning editions, yeah. as close to the original as possible. They've got a fleet of editors who are looking at Beethoven's incredibly messy hand mm -hmm. handwriting and uh, thinking, okay, well, there's a discrepancy between the cello and the violin here, but then we're going to make this editorial decision and do this. And we're looking at this incredibly clean <clears throat> copy. But back then, they would have been looking at some copyist's hand mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, piece this together, maybe with little rehearsal time and present it. But uh, it must have been very finely rehearsed. It must have been. I would think so. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, like, like I said, yeah, like I, said I, I don't think the music would have stuck around if, if they had just kind of fake their way through it once or twice it just doesn't it just i mean the the ideas are just too um obscure i guess yeah mm -hmm. absolutely so by this time beethoven was i he was feeling the sense of deafness if he, i don't know if he was, yeah. wasn't deaf already 
Well, he was, but he was, he was definitely feeling it. Like this was definitely part of his, um, his journey at the time was that he was starting to feel more and more deaf. And I think it was probably more and more forcing him inside his own head. Like this, this music going on to his later stuff becomes very um, intellectual. Like um, uh, it becomes stuff that is planned out. He's got ideas that this is, it's going to go to this key area. It's going to go to this key area and they're worked out and it doesn't, it doesn't have that sort of organic flow the way his earlier stuff does or the way that, um, Schubert, you know, does, it doesn't have that sort of organic sort of, you know, we're going from this key to this key and it sort of, um, has a sort of a flow, a natural order to it. It's, it's definitely an intellectual exercise in a lot of ways, the, the choices that he makes. So yeah, his, um, his deafness really starts to become an issue. And like, this is the stuff that the same time as he's writing his Beethoven, well, yeah, his Beethoven. <laughs> he's the same time as he's writing his Symphony Number no. Five and his Number no. Six. It was known, yeah, even then it was known as his Beethoven Five and Beethoven Six. But no, he was writing uh, his sixth and his fifth symphony at the same time as this, and he wrote all these string quartets about the same time. And it was a time when he was really starting to sort of have to go inside himself because outside of him was starting to become blocked off by his deafness for sure. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I hear things are more angular, they're more abrupt. It's, um, mm. I don't know if they're angrier uh, into the slow, you know, the slow movement that that moment of just exhaling, mm -hmm. it's bigger, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more cosmic, it's a little bit yeah. uh, you know, cosmic, it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, a larger scale. It just mm -hmm. you just get the sense that he's striving for uh, bigger ideas, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know this this for the first movement. So this thing's in E minor, right? Yeah. Um. Tell me, tell me something. Tell me something. Tell me something interesting. Well, this. I don't know. I don't know. I, like years ago, we when we did the Schubert Quintet, we talked about um, Neapolitan chord regions or. Um, flat flat six and flat two chord regions and he uses those pivot chords really um intentionally to create this sort of the music could go anywhere moments like he he has this sort of um right off the top he, he gives you just two chords like very much very operatic like you would almost expect then to hear like a a, a bass uh, um uh just um ugh, what's the word i'm looking for uh Aria? No, no, the the other part, the other, not the aria, the um, recit? recit, the recitative. Sorry, yeah, I, I blanked out there for a second. The rest, you would expect to hear a recitative at that point, like a bum bum, and then the bass would do the whoa, 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 that kind of thing. But um, the 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 fact is that um, it, then it just kind of um, we we have this really mysterious ethereal E minor da 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 da, and that. But then immediately he takes that so up a semitone, sort of into a into a nebulous sort of flat flat two region, and that creates this just sense like this could go anywhere. And I mean, he, at that point it doesn't. He ends up staying in E minor for a little while and he comes back to it. But eventually he uses those um, semitone uh, flat key areas to to just be able to sort of take left turns, right turns wherever he wants to, like with, with um, the traditional sort of tonal writing that he would have picked up from Haydn and Mozart, um, there, were, there was a quite a limited number of places you could go harmonically and get, and then, you know, and then you'd always be steered back to your, your home key or to your fifth key, you know, that kind of thing, your dominant or your tonic. But in this case, he, he sets up immediately, he sets up the language that the music could go anywhere. So he's got a real um, mystery, a sense of the mystery of, of everything. Like he's really, referring to the mystery of the spheres the mystery of the the heavens the cre creation and he's he's just set that up very simply in the first 10 10 bars of the first movement just just the space that those first two chords that could mean anything then a little bit of silence then he's got the really mysterious main theme that relates to the second version of the the main theme by a semitone and those just those you know he's putting you in a really um murky um mysterious spot right off the top of the movement and audience of the day i think that they would be uh, i'm taking a guess here but they probably would be internally tracking these these uh, key changes the changes of tonality um i think to today 
you know, today's listener, or the, you know, the average under chamber listener, you you might not be tracking the, the the E minor shift to the F major, but but you can certainly hear the surprise. You can certainly hear, oh, that's a little bit strange. I think that there is a cer- still a, a certain level of expectation in our ears, and it's that that level of expectation that Beethoven still toying around with and playing with. And as you say, these, it's like these key pivot, you know, uh, chordal region areas or tonal areas that, that you can go in any which direction. I think that's especially cool. And then the whole, this, this whole thing of folk melody that mm. um, it doesn't really show up anywhere else in the quartet, except for in the third movement. Mm. He pulls out this, 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 this tune. What's the name of it? Glory, glory to the sun. Glory to the sun. Yeah. Glory to the sun. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool. It, it's a cool one. Cause um, now is it the same one? I, I have such a terrible memory for tunes, but is it the same one that they use in Boris Goodenough or it's, it's, just, or is it just like it? It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it is the same one. It is actually the same one. Right. Okay. Cause I know that there's this point in Boris Goodenough where everyone's the whole crowd is just saying, you know, Save us, save us, uh, uh, Boris Gudinov. You're gonna, you're gonna, you know, become our savior, kind of thing like this. And and um, and the whole crowd singing and it, and and it add eventually he adds the whole orchestra and bells like church bells and stuff like that. It becomes a real um, churchy kind of thing. And it's it's kind of interesting how he uses this in the quartet. Um, first of all, um, finding like it, it's a, a very clear and natural six bar phrase which is something that you don't get a lot in uh, regular sort of Viennese music so it has a little bit of an oddity to that to begin with so like his um his uh players and his listeners probably wouldn't have really expected something which just naturally goes six bars because that's not really you know part of the trick of Mozart and Haydn was always trying to make things into longer phrases through you know, alighted cadences and, and harmonic tricks and stuff like that. But this was just a, a tune that goes six bars and that would have been in and of itself fairly strange. And then the other part is that it just doesn't harmonically go anywhere. Like like a, a Beethoven or a Mozart or a Haydn tune harmonically goes, you know, da, 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 you know, has that sort of uh, mm-hmm. chord progression kind of quality to it. This just sits there in the, in the major key the whole time, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. So that could re- create a really strange sort of um, sta- stasis in the movement, but he uses, actually, he, he goes in places in this whole quartet and, you know, could talk about it for a while, but um, he goes to sort of minimalist places, places like Arvo Parrot went and, um, or goes and uh, places that uh, a lot of minimalist composers go. And he does that. And this is something that Arvo Parrot, the term that he uses is tin tin nabulation, which is you start, you start a thing going and then you start another thing going and you just let them kind of work their way out. Just like you do if you start a bell ringing and you start another bell ringing, the, they'll, they'll work their way out. And the sort of um, almost um, random way that the, the sounds go together creates its own kind of sound. And that's what uh, Beethoven does in the, the third movement. Um, he uses this sort of really simple, non-harmonically changing thing and he starts it and then you know, just like a fugue, you start it and then you start another one and he does the fugue thing. But as he goes along, it becomes more just like he starts it, then he starts it and he starts it and he starts it. And they all kind of um, work their way through independently. But the way that the thing, um, the sounds react becomes a sort of cacophony of sound that creates this beautiful sort of bell idea, which is very similar to what happens in that Boris Gudinov um, scene, which, which is that all the the bells actually come in, but the, the tune itself creates this sense of... Um, the church bells, the the orthodox uh, church sound that you would have sort of expected in Russia at the time. So it, it, it's it's a very cool um, moment, and I'm not you know I'm not sure how much he was trying to be church be, be like that sort of orthodox sound, but that's definitely the result of what he was doing there. Yeah, yeah, I get it. That is such an unusual movement, and he mis you know mm-hmm. in the beginning he misplaces the uh, the the beat where you think that the yeah. beat is and. I don't know. <clears throat> it's very clever, very sleight of hand. Very mm-hmm. um, we just have another minute. Wow. Fourth movement. Uh, it's a joyful. It's C major. C major. Playing with these thirds. Yeah. And uh, it's just great. Yeah. It's it's cool, and and it is. I mean, it's neat that he was writing this at the same time as as the fifth, right? His his fifth, yeah. because same sort of deal. Yeah, you come out of the scherzo, which is murky, like you say, mm-hmm. um, in the string quartet. It's it's. Um, he's misplaced the beat and it's kind of angular and it's strange. It's murky. He's got this strange um, other country kind of sound. And then he 
bam, he goes, he drops the, he drops down a major third and we end up in C major. Right. So it's, it's got that real, um, that's, that's one of his favorite tricks for like opening up the skies is he, he changes keys, either goes up a major third or he goes down a major third. And all of a sudden it feels like the skies have opened because you're in a, in a whole new world, right? Like we're used to those fifth transitions going five to one, but he goes down a major third instead. And all of a sudden it's like the, the, the world has opened up and, and uh, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a brave new world. And that's sort of the Beethoven experience. There it is. I'm looking forward to performing the, with this with you, Ben. And with you, you sound great. <laughs> it's uh, it's been on our list uh, for quite a while, so mm -hmm. uh, it's been great to to put this together. All right, I think that's it for this right. edition of Inner Chamber Connections and uh, our last edition for the season. So thank you for joining me. Okay, see you soon. Okay. <laughs>